Praise God. Thank you, Ben. God is good. Um, yeah. Also, too, uh, I, mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've got a lot of babies now. Yeah. You guys don't stop having babies. So uh, we encourage you, if you'd like to help out in the nursery once a month, uh, because we're needing a little bit more workers, especially now we've got Thursday service. So just hop out, amen, with uh, the babies. Amen. You guys are being fruitful. You're being, you're, hey, we're obeying that that command from God to be fruitful. So with that, we need workers. Well, ladies, you know, men, you stay out of it because, you know, you, know, you, know, you just make, you make it worse. But you sisters, hey, hey, just, you know, volunteer once a month, okay? Appreciate that. There's a sign sheet in the back also for that. All right, you got your Bibles. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 9. Acts 9. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 6. This is one of my favorite conversion stories in the Bible. and Hopefully we can get something new from this. Acts 9, verse 1 through 6. The Bible says, uh, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he so that if he found any who are of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and and heard a voice saying to him, "Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me?" And he said, "Who are you, Lord?" Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Let's stop there for a moment. I'm going to read a little bit more in a little while. But, you know, as a preacher and a pastor, one of the most difficult truths to, con to convey to those that sit in those pews is this. And the truth is that God, can God really use your life for his honor and glory and for his kingdom? Right. Now, it should not, that should not be a difficult question to, be, to answer because if you see those that are being used by God, if God can use us and them, he can use you. Right. Come on. It's good to see a new... Backup singer, kind of go, kind of confirmation what I'm preaching about. If God can use Roseanne, He can use anyone. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, because I may know most that are being involved didn't see themselves being involved. They weren't looking for glory. In fact, they ran from this because people who are genuinely saved and feel they're called by God usually are fearful and shirk back from wanting to do it because of what because of all the above reasons come on can god really use your life you might be thinking here we go again every time i step into this place you will want me to do something for jesus right but the bible tells those in this position that one of my responsibilities is to equip the saints for service for for ministry this is one of my main responsibilities if not one of the most important responsibilities for without your involvement the gospel does not be does not spread in our cities and our homes and beyond right. now we can gather together and have a nice little kumbaya church and have a little club and you know and and you know and hold hands and all that and have maybe uh, barbecues together and that's fine don't get me wrong but what i'm trying to get at uh we are called to to reach people and more importantly the lost in our cities and in our homes and beyond. Right. Now, you might be wondering, well, you know, I've got a lot of things going on. And God can use anyone. It might not be so much uh, your, your, your age, uh, your uh, personality and all these things. But God can use you regardless. It might not be in a spotlight position where, you know, you're in front of people. But there's a lot of ministries that don't involve being in the spotlight. There's many ministries that, that, that really affect the church. You know, you can be a Holy Ghost prayer warrior, one that really does pray for all that need prayer, lay hands on people. You can be a, a, a giver. Uh, maybe you can't do other things, but we can all give. How I many nobody, nobody wants that in ministry? Anyway, uh, 
There's so many things that we can be involved in. Uh, but we have a million and one reasons why we don't get involved. And one thing I know, and personally you know, speaking, is that uh, what happens is obstacles get in our way. And you have to overcome obstacles. Those obstacles that are hindering you from fulfilling God's purpose and plan in your life. So every time I read the story of Saul or Paul, I stand in amazement of the grace of God. Every time I see, like it really gave me, it really, I was really blessed to see a new person up here. It really touched my heart. We go like, wow, you know, it, you know, that's another person involved. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't make you a better person. It doesn't make you a more prettier person. It doesn't make you a more faithful person or a more holier person. But there's something, amen, that I, be, I know that God takes joy in when someone rises up. Okay? But when I hear this or read the story of Paul, you know, and how he was transformed, we know his testimony. He was a hater of Christians. He was a persecutor of those that were of the way, the Lord's way, those who profess Christ. He uh, was zealous to get rid of that whole movement of Jesus Christ and his disciples and their spreading of the gospel. But as I read this, there is hope for you and I that God can use you and I. Because Saul, he's a very unlikely candidate for the service of the Lord. He, he was, like I said, he murdered, he killed Christians, he put them in prison. He was hated by Christians. He did everything in his power to destroy the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But God reached down in grace. He took this man from where he was and he used him to change the world. One man. I'll let you know what person can make the biggest difference in a family. When I say man, I mean women too. One person that just think can make the biggest difference in a, in, in a city, uh, in the world and beyond. All it takes is one. Come on. But we never, in our brain, we never feel that we could be that one though, huh? You never assume or think, well, I can't be that one. You know, I'm just trying to be, that's really, I'm just trying to stay saved. Well, guess what? You can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can stay saved and also do something for Jesus. Okay? You, you can do it. When we look at Paul, though, uh, we're tempted to think, man, this guy was just a super saint. I mean, he, he was all that. There's no way, no possible way the, the Lord can use me like he did Paul. Come on. Or even use me at all. Because sometimes I think we feel inferior, uh, unworthy uh, to do the Lord of the work. But I'm here to tell you today that he can and will use you if you simply make yourself available. Come on. And I want to talk briefly about obstacles. Those obstacles that are hindering you. Like I said, you know, yeah, you know, I'm talking about ministry, but also too, I may know that we've been called also to be godly fathers and husbands, godly mothers and wives, godly children. Come on. So uh, God can really use your life. But like I said, I think a lot of times we don't feel that we're capable of it. And there's obstacles. And one thing I've known, amen, or one thing I know for a fact that hinders many is sometimes our past. Anybody got a past? We all do. Let me share something with you. Your past is not an obstacle uh, when it comes to the kingdom of God. In verse 1, uh, look at, look at this, is, this is Paul's past. He, he was a murderer, okay? Uh, against the disciples of the Lord. He was a persecutor. He had an ugly and evil and wicked past. Come on. In fact, if you read in the book of Acts chapter 7, he is the one that gave the green light to kill the first Christian martyr. That was Stephen. Remember Stephen? He's the one, amen, that gave the green light. He sent the mob. He sent the hit, he sent the hit squad to stone Stephen. And as they went and stoned him, he's the one, the Bible says, that he washed their clothes. They, got, they, they changed, they did whatever. So he was the watcher of the clothes. And he, gave, he was a shot card. Go take this guy out. 
So he was he had a bad past. Come on. So don't let your past be an obstacle. Paul was a wicked man. He was an evil man. He was a mean man. Come on. Regardless of what you have done in the past, before you receive Jesus as your Savior, it matters no longer. What does the Bible say? That God, when he forgives us our sin, he tosses all our sin into the sea of forgetfulness. Don't you wish your wife would have that toss all your drama in the sea of forgetfulness? Come on, man. Or your husband. Man, what's it give? Stop already. Throw it in that ocean already or that sea. Man. But the Bible says that God will toss him in the sea of forgetfulness where he don't bring it up no more. Come on. Because I may know that we have like, I, I call it, we have like three records of our past. One record is the one that's in our mind that we know of, right? The, the one that we know our past. The second record that we keep well, is the one that people keep. Your family that knows your past. Society that knows your past. And then there's a third record. And that's the one that Satan keeps. Because how many know he knows your past too? And he'll do everything in his power to bring up your past to hinder you and to become an obstacle in God using you. Come on. Because we know it is evil and wicked when your past is brought up. Doesn't it hinder you? Doesn't it bother you? I know it hinders me. and I, But I'm not sure for my past. I know what I was, but I know what I am now. And I have no problem telling people of my past, not in a glory not in a glorifying way or in a pride way or boastful. Who wants to be, really, who would be proud to boast of their past? Uh, yeah, I'm so proud, amen, that I was an ex heroin addict and I was steal and rob and, and hurt my family and my kids. That's nothing to be proud of. But also, but also, in the same token, I will let people know what I was only so I can give a testimony of what he's done for me now. Huh? Don't let your past be an obstacle, your past condition. And your past might have been just yesterday. Come on. You walked in today, you feel very unworthy today. You feel like, I'm just not good today. I'm just, uh, there's no way. I, I feel I feel bad, I feel gosh, I feel this, I feel condemned, I feel guilt-ridden, I feel this. Let me tell you something. God, amen, if you will humble yourself and repent, and kneel before him in the cross, he'll forgive you. Now people, they'll hold your your past on the file for a little bit. Because I mean, no people like to put you on probation. They, you know, they, but God doesn't. If you cry out to him, he says, those who call upon my name will be saved. You know, in the Bible, there were many men, countless people that had a past. Simon Peter, remember him? He backslid when Jesus went to the cross that day. He, he literally turned his back on God. He turned around and went the other way when confronted of who he was. But if you remember after the resurrection and he was restored, Jesus, I mean, Paul, I mean, Peter, he preached one of the most powerful messages ever where thousands got saved. God restored them. The, the church was established through him first. So his, though he had a past, he had backslid, he had turned away from Christ at his most needed time, that was not an obstacle for God to use him in the, in the most powerful way. Think about Moses. We know the past of Moses. He was a murderer. We know he killed an Egyptian soldier, didn't he? He killed him, and then he, he tried to hide it and buried him in the sand. Remember that story? And he split, he kicked rocks. He was a murderer, and he became the deliverer of Israel. Come on. I think about Samson, lover boy. Remember Samson? He liked freaky women. Hmm? He sinned against God. Uh, it seemed like at, at every turn, he continued to fall into that, you know, that same old sin. But you remember what happened that, you know, he was blind. And we know his story. But at the end of his life, he killed more Philistines than he did in the beginning of his life. So your past is no obstacle or, or when it comes to God using you. 
But you might be thinking, oh, you know, it's not so much my past, Pastor Eddie. It's my present circumstance right now. This is why I kind of, I kind of, you know, just kind of hold back. Well, here we, we read in verse 1 that, you know, Paul was known for being a killer of Christians. In fact, in the present, in verse 2, he, he was on his way to go and persecute more Christians. That was going on that day. Come on. He, he was going to take them out and destroy anyone or anything connected with the name of Jesus Christ. Come on. Whatever present circumstance you might be carrying right now or what you're, that you're experiencing, God can still use you. You have a past, yes, I get that, but it shouldn't be an obstacle. You have a present, you know, maybe there's something right now in your present situation that you find yourself bogged down by it, you find yourself hindered by it. It, sh it, can, it should not be an obstacle, obstacle for you. You know, I remember one years ago, I mean, maybe Sides remembers this, we're out in the front. And we were putting uh, that banner, Reaching the Lost Any Cost. I think it was that one. And we had about, there was about four or five of us. And the van stopped. And, and there was a lady. And she, oh, I like your banner. And she goes, by the way, we're from so-and-so church. It's a big church. And she was like, uh, you know, we're having this, I forgot what event it was. We're having this event, but, so we're out here inviting the smaller churches. And I go, okay, excuse me. I mean, for being a smaller <laughs> church, I guess. But, you know, that's what I was thinking. Then she left. And then she left. I said, okay, God bless you, whatever. And I started thinking, man, she better be thankful for this smaller church. I'll tell you why. Because at one time, the head usher probably sold, would have sold drugs to your kid. Get it? Because of our past. Huh? You better be thankful, sister, of this little church. Because at one time, you know, our, our, our teacher, she, she probably would have went on with your old man at one time or another. Come on. Yeah. And don't even give me start with the pastor. So thank God. What my point being is that God, the whole point of that story is that God can use us. Uh, and no matter if you've got a past that is terrible and, and you feel condemned, you feel guilt-ridden, you feel that nobody forgives you, you feel that God hasn't forgiven you. If you genuinely repent, God will forgive you of all sin. And don't let no one bring up the past to remind you of it. Come on. I, you know what? I don't let it get to me. My past, you know what? It, it, it was what it was. But I don't let the devil condemn me. And I get, you know, you know, couples and, you know, let me tread lightly here. We have a tendency to bring up the past, don't we? We do. Come on. I mean, I don't. But how do we know we have a tendency to do that? And it hurts when they bring up the past, doesn't it? It does. Okay. It, it bothers us. Because if the past, it kind of affects the present. And these are obstacles that you and I must not let get in the way when it comes God using us. You have a present condition around. There's a present circumstance in your life right now. Don't let the present hinder you. Uh, it could be it could be a lot of issues. It could be you know a financial one. It could be an emotional one. It could be uh, a, a, a health, a physical one. Something in your present circumstance is hindering you from going and being involved in the things of God. Don't let it hinder you. Come on. See, let me share something with you. Let me give you a mind revelation. Your present circumstance it didn't catch the Lord by surprise. He knows what you're going through right now. He knows where your mind is. He knows where your heart is. He knows your thoughts. Every thought. Okay. He knows your insecurities. He knows your frailties. He knows everything. For he formed every part about you. But the devil and people are good at times. I put obstacles before us. To cause you and I to shirk back from this calling of ours. Whatever it is. And he does a good job of it, doesn't he? Well, I'm not holy enough. Okay? I'm not spiritual enough. Are you saved? If you are born again, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, come on. If you have made a co complete 180 and, you're, and you have turned from sin as a lifestyle, then you are born again. 
Don't let nobody take that from you. Your, so your past condition is no obstacle. should not be. Your present circumstances are no obstacle. But thirdly, I think sometimes, uh, I think sometimes we do, our personal characteristics are obstacles. Come on. There's something, our personality, we feel for whatever reason, they just, you know, you know, people, you know, I'm not a people person. How many here have said that? Well, I'm not a people person. I can't be involved like others and be in front of people and work with people and talk with people. And But how many know you were a people person back in the day? Because you were the one, amen, on top of the coffee table swinging from the chandelier when the party was going. Remember? You remember. Hmm? Oh, you, man, you were the one singing the loudest when that song came on. Hello. And all of a sudden now, we don't become, like I said so many times, well, I'm not a people person. No. Don't let your personal characteristics become an obstacle. Now, think about Paul. His character was known to be mean. His character was known to be zealous to kill for killing Christians and persecuting them and throwing them in prison. So his characteristic and his personality was one of lie. You know what? <laughs> you know, I don't know, man. I don't think I want to be around this guy. Come on. He had many personal characteristics that were, how can I say, people did not like. He was mean, he was known for this, but also too. He, if you study his life, and I have, did you know Paul, like I say, when you picture Paul, you picture him as some superman, some superhuman Christian, right? Did you know, unfortunately, he was short in stature, okay? He was kind of overweight. He, he was physically, his appearance physically, he wasn't all that. He was probably like a two, okay? All right. The Bible says too, if you read it, that he is also he was eloquent, eloquent in speech. He stuttered and couldn't pronounce words at times. Though he was smart, he knew the, the the law of Moses. I mean, like the back of his hand, he knew the law. I mean, he, but he had a, a, a speech impediment. All right, and uh, he also wasn't very healthy. So if you read the history, he had a lot of personal characteristics and flaws that would make most people just shirk back from any type of uh, involvement. Come on. Well, Pastor, you know, you know, physically I'm not able to do it. I understand. I've had, you know what, I, you know, before, when I became a pastor, physically I was in top shape. But man, being a pastor, I got hit with this, I got hit with that, I got hit with that. Like before I used to be, you guys remember for those who were here, when in the beginning when I started when I started the church, I didn't believe in people staying away from church if you were sick. No, unless you unless your if you, unless your leg is cut off, you need to be here. Okay? Unless you got a broken something, you got a note from the doctor, you didn't be here. Remember? I don't know if you remember. I'll pray you. Like there's no excuse for not being here. You remember? You remember? Then, <laughs> Okay, but then all of a sudden I got sick. All of a sudden, you know, I got in my back, I messed up. All of a sudden, you know, hepatitis and all that. I said, wait a second, this don't feel good. I don't feel like going to church today. You know, I would push myself because I didn't have no sick days. I didn't have no personal time like you guys do. That's a joke. Get it? All right. And I go, man. So I understand that if you have a physical infirmity, it's hard. It's hard to be involved, right? It is. But it doesn't mean that you cannot do nothing. Because like I said, there are a lot of, you know, I get it. We get older. I'm not, hey, I ain't gonna spring. I ain't gonna pop no more. Come on. It takes me a lot to get out of bed and wind up or wind, you know, get going. Come on. I mean, I, I get it. But eventually I get there. Come on. And I pray that God will keep you another 30 years in ministry, whatever amount he has for me. But don't let your personal characteristics, your maybe any kind of infirmity, uh, hinder that. Because God can use you. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, clean the church and, and, and be an usher or, or uh, wash baby behinds. But it, it could, there's a lot of ministries that God can use you. And I already mentioned them. 
Don't let your personal, as, as Mexicans say, complejos get in the way. Mm -hmm. And what happens, see, let me tell you something. We, when we start thinking about our personal qualities and our characteristics, we begin to compare ourselves with others. And when you begin to compare yourself with others, you're in for a rough ride. You are unique. Hello? God created you specifically the way you are. All right? You are unique. He made you in his image. Whether you feel you should be taller, skinnier, uh, you should have red eyes, blue eyes, or green eyes. Okay? Black hair, no hair, some hair, blonde hair. God created you the way he created you. Okay? I question God, how come you didn't make me at least 5'8? I'll sit five eight. I even got tempted to wear like some shoes like Prince. Because he you know he was only five two. Did you know he wore like he wears some I don't know what he you know, you know he's kind of weird. But I'm like, I ain't going that route. You gotta accept me as I am. Woman. Okay? I got other quality. How many do we have to play? We, we, our person, uh, we, we, the, our parents, or, uh, we, we judge ourselves pretty bad sometimes. Come on, harshly, don't we? Yeah, there's a few of you that are cute and you let the whole world know that you are. Good to have confidence, okay? But that's a hindrance too. Because there's no one like you, my Lord. You start seeing, when we sing that song, you say, there's no one like me, my Lord. No one can take my place. <laughs> Your heart beats for me. <laughs> but thank God, amen, there's, none of, there's no one like that here. We're all uh, humble and thankful that we, like I told a brother the other day, he was thankful for his wife. I said, well, thank God that, that God blinded her. <laughs> God, <laughs> Hello? Hmm? Well, I told him one time, he goes, you're not even my type. Isn't that messed up? Man, could you have let your wife tell you, you're not even my type. You go to complain with not you? But I say, you know what? It's all right. You know what? It's cool. But you will love me. I told her that. You will marry me. I'm going to marry you. Before we're dating, I'm not going to marry you. Oh, you will. There's something about me. That you that, that just you know what you don't know you know what it's secret stuff it's secret. <laughs> but you you're gonna love me you don't even know why. Been married thirty years. Who won? Yeah. I did. <laughs> and I'm not even joking. Take that. <laughs> but how many know we have? So all these things are obstacles. I mean, really. Uh, there, there's so many obstacles and but God has provided everything to overcome those obstacles you know you feel you're weak you're not strong enough what did Paul like I said Paul re researches his, his life he was he was bad in appearance he, he he stuttered like me sometimes I can't pronounce words he 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 didn't look that good he was ugly. The, 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 the term you ladies use, that means ugly. Huh? <laughs> uh, and then to top it off, after in his ministry, the Bible says that uh, God, or no, no, the Satan sent a messenger to humble him and gave him a thorn in the flesh. So poor dude, he's already short. He stutters. He's kind of he's kind of overweight. He's got a unibrow. He's got half hair. Like he has a comb over. He tore up. Come on. And then the top of all, God says, "Okay, saying, go ahead and keep him humble. Humble. He's already looks humble, poor guy. <laughs> but you will remember, prior to that scripture, God had allowed him to go to the third heaven. Okay. Now the first heaven is the blue sky and the clouds." The second heaven is the universe and the stars. The third heaven is the presence of God. Homeboy got to go up there and see what was in the third heaven. And, he, and this is where the Bible says that, you know, he talks about it. I went to the third heaven. 
but God sent Satan sent a messenger to humble me so I would not get proud. Because he was probably gonna write a book. He was probably gonna put it on TikTok. Yeah. It was gonna be all over Snap. Man, you know, you know, he was probably gonna make a movie out of it. Get it? Because he went to the third heaven. And God said, you know what? Nah. Boom. He humbled him. He allowed Satan to. So he had all this going for him. He, it was, but you know what? He became and is one of the most powerful apostles ever. He wrote over one third of the New Testament. In spite of all the obstacles, okay, he was able to think, think about this, accomplish great work for God. So your personal issues are no obstacle. Because let me know sometimes we've got things that are very personal and uh, we just feel unworthy. We feel, you know, at times not good enough. Uh, we feel that it's just a lie of the enemy. Okay, God can use you. You got personal issues. And Paul knew, he, like I said, he had a lot going on. He said one thing after that famous chapter. He said, you know what? For when I am weak, then I am strong. You feel weak. You feel insecure. You feel unworthy. Let me tell you something. That is weakness. But Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, I always wonder why God always chooses the fools of the world. Didn't he say that? I chose the foolish things of the world. He chose the weak things of the world. It's amazing. If God, you always choose the ones that really are not all that. And I'm not talking about appearance, but I'm talking about frailties. I'm talking about their past. I'm talking about their present. I'm talking about their issues, their personality. It seems like God always used people like you and I. He, he never uses those great superstars in, in you, on YouTube. Come on. Or on TV. He seems like he chooses you and I. And I understand why. Because when he uses you and I, he's the one that gets the glory. When we do anything, <laughs> let me tell you something. And I'm saying this with humility. When we accomplish something in the kingdom of God, whether ushering, whether teaching, whether singing, whether playing, whether preaching, let me tell you something. God gets all the glory. Good. Let me share something. As, as great as I am, trust me. Okay. God could, I could not keep this going unless it was God. And he gets all the glory and honor. I've made mistakes. I said some stupid stuff. I have offended people. Come on. And my wife always reminds me of that. Like she gave me that look like, oh no. <laughs> Write that down for me. And we're going to talk at the church. Okay. I was like, God, how can you mean? And sure, God, and you know what prayer is? I'll be honest with you. I say, Lord, use me in spite of me. And I'm not saying that, oh, woe is me. And, you know, get a whip and hit my back. No, but really, I'm not all that. Yeah, I can fix a toilet. I can build a wall. I can paint a room. I can do some electric. I can, yeah, I'm grateful for the gifts or like those talents that God gives me in that area. Don't get me wrong. But the spiritual things, the ones that come for eternity, I am so humbled by the fact that he wouldn't even think of me. So we have all these obstacles. Don't let your past be an obstacle. Don't let your present condition be an obstacle. Don't let your personal characteristics and your issues be an obstacle. Okay? The issue is, and it all comes down to the, the secret lies in one word to be used by God. Surrender. Come on. Are you totally surrendered to the Lord and to his will for your life? Because that's the key, isn't it? Maybe you already know all this. And you understand all this, but there's one thing lacking, surrender. Hmm? Can God use your life? He can. But it, but it must be first his to use it. That's, that is the condition. He said, you know what? I can use your life. You bring you bring what you got to the table. <laughs> and then we do that. We came to church. We brought everything. We gave, we gave our mess. He said, oh my God, what am I going to do with all this? And then the Bible says he'll give you beauty for ashes. Huh? We brought an ash heap, didn't we? Remember that sermon? Uh, keep your ash off the altar. Uh, not ash, A-S-H. 
just for you that thought I said something else. <laughs> huh? I'll give you beauty. You bring me your heap of mess, your frailties, your, 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 your complexes, your insecurities, your loneliness, your, your, un, what are you, your unworthiness. You bring it to me and I will make an exchange. But you got to surrender. Huh? So I'm going to end with a few questions to be considered when it comes to being used, to really being used by God. Are you really saved? Does it mean, okay, that doesn't mean that you're a good person. Because there are many good people in this world that are not saved. They're good people. In fact, they even act better than most Christians. Okay? It doesn't mean that you've gotten baptized. It doesn't mean that you're a member of TCOM. But are you truly saved? Have you received the Lord as the master of your life, the Lord of your life, and you have repented from sin, and you are, you are a new creation in Christ? Are you fully surrendered? Come on. Is your absolute all on the altar of God? Are you holding anything back? Because everything must be His. Come on. Thirdly, are you av available for Him to use? Well, Pastor, my life's so cluttered right now with everything going on. There's nowhere for the Lord to get in any way to use me because my life is just cluttered. I got so many appointments. I got so many things with my kids. I got so many things with that. Let me show you something. I don't care how life, much your life is cluttered. When we want to do something, how we know we will do it. Come on. You can have a schedule that is filled daily. But if you want to go and take off for a couple of days and go to Disneyland, go to the coast, go over here, go over there, you will take time off from work. Huh? Come on. You don't care if you're not even getting paid for it. But when it comes to church and the things of God, all of a sudden, well, you know what? I got to work. Don't get me wrong. You do got to work. The Bible says you don't work, you don't need. But it's got to be your own. Come on. And last question, are you willing to be used by the Lord? Because he's not going to force you to serve him. Just as much as I won't force you. Okay? He will not force you into anything at all. He will challenge you. He will convict you. He will lead you. But he will not force you. He still loves you. Let me bring, he loves you. Come on. It's like your parents, you got kids. They don't do no work at all in your house. They don't clean the room. They don't mow the lawn. They don't cook for themselves. They don't even put the clothes in the basket. And there's a basket right there. They throw it next to it. Um, but you still love them, right? You still love them. Well, at least mom does. That's for sure. <laughs> huh? but God still loves you. But you're missing out on the greatest blessing. Because to everyone, I'm going to hear everyone that has taken that step of faith to be used by God, when they finally get involved and begin to do it, there, there is a satisfaction, spiritual satisfaction in them that it cannot compare to the things of the world. Oh, uh, don't get me wrong. You get weary. You get a little tired. And some days you feel like, oh, I don't want to do this today. I don't want to preach to a bunch of rebels today. I don't want to talk to that person on the phone for three hours. In the end, all they're going to do is not listen to me. Oh, you'll have those days. Oh, my God, I want to go. Wow, wow, we, we, crying, crying, right? <laughs> but you know what? But you know what? Every time I feel like that, never, it, 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 God always, always reminds me that, you know what? How blessed I am that he even thought to use me. And you feel that once you get used. Can God really use your life? Let's find out. Amen. Let's bow our heads this afternoon.